Hey guys, and welcome to another bonus show of your favourite podcast. My name's Sean Williams, I'm coming to you from the criminal hotbed of Aotearoa, New Zealand. Uh, mana watia and matariki from, to my friends out here, by the way. But today we're headed a few thousand miles across the Pacific to Mexico, Sonora to be precise. Uh, and that's where the country's cartels are getting into something which I guess may at first seem a bit little left field, um, but actually it makes perfect sense when you look at all the other crazy stuff they're into. And that is, yes, jellyfish. Uh, my guest today is Luis Chaparro, writer, photographer, filmmaker, and he just published a piece a few days ago for the Daily Beast entitled Cocaine, Marijuana, Jellyfish, Cartels Muscling on New Export Business. So uh, without giving any more away, because I've probably already given most of it away, <laughs> uh, cheers for joining us, Luis. Um, what's all this about and uh, how did you first get a sniff of it? Absolutely. Uh, thank you for, for having me, man. And um, so the whole, the whole thing about this story is how the Sinaloa cartel is literally multiplying everything in Mexico. Every, every activity that is uh, profitable enough for them, they're going to they're gonna try and put their hands on. They've been doing a lot of, um, a lot of work around the, uh, the fishing side of, uh, of stuff in, in Mexico with uh, Tatuaba and also with um, a, a certain kind of turtle. Uh, but I just recently learned that they're doing that too with the jellyfish. And um, jellyfish in Mexico has no value whatsoever. It's actually considered sort of like a, like a plague. And mm. um, it, we don't really use it for anything. But... Uh, but for exportation, the jellyfish gets exported and then sold to Vietnam and Singapore, if I'm not mistaken. Then those two countries, um, at, at the time, they sell it to China. So apparently in China, it's a, um, a good dish, you know, a fine dish. So mm. that leaves around 10 billion Mexican pesos of revenue on a span of around three to four months every year. So that's that's a lot of money. And that's been happening through the last, probably last 10, 15 years. But just very recently, the Sinaloa cartel decided to try and monopolize this industry by forcing fishermen not to go straight to these um, salt companies. Because when you, when you fish the... Um, the jellyfish, what you need is a, a lot of salt, industrial salt, to dehydrate the jellyfish and then sell it already dehydrated. Um, that's how you get your, your worth with a, the with a jellyfish. Now, I learned, because I, I learned a local news talking about how the t alleged members of the Sinaloa cartel stopped a pickup truck, well, no, a trailer truck, of these uh, salt company from Baja California and how they burn two of their trucks and beat two of their employees. So to me, I mean, it was, I, I thought it was only a matter of extortion, right? Like someone was yeah. extorting yeah. these guys and trying to get the money out of these companies. But then I spoke with a couple of fishermen in the state of Sonora, which is bordering Baja California, and where the jellyfish is for the most part uh, being uh, taken. And they told me that this was not only extortion, that they actually were stopping these salt trucks to avoid them selling or buying uh, the, um, the jellyfish straight from the fishermen. Now they're gonna have to go through the cartel if they want to keep um, you know, uh, yeah, basically working on the industry. It, I mean, I, I've had the misfortune of eating jellyfish in a Chinese restaurant, actually, and it had like, and like it's interesting you talk about the sorting thing because it, uh, it had so How much it? salt. It had so much salt in it. I couldn't even tell you what the stuff tastes like. And in the morning, I woke up and I was my head was like bloated, like I had wow. some kind of alien disease. It was, it was crazy. It was like so much salt. I like was like. My whole body was turned inside <laughs> out. But yeah, this That's stuff is crazy. like big business in, in China, of course. And I guess like this is kind of part of the biggest story about the cartels, particular Sinaloa cartel, like just kind of worming their way into every single legitimate business in Mexico, <laughs> right? I mean, they're, they're basically, you know, 
you talk about a small time gangster buying a laund- laundromat to get like to wash money. This is like the the biggest money laundering operation on the planet, yeah. right? They're just taking over everything. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And you know what, like, whenever, whenever there is war in Mexico, uh, either an infighting between the same cartel as in this case, or several cartels fighting the government or cartels fighting each other for, for territory, uh, they always look for other profitable activities. Um, this year as well, I think it's. Uh, I think it was actually by the end of last year, like around November, I traveled to the mountains of Chihuahua to report on how the same cartel, the same Sinaloa cartel, different faction, was monopolizing water in a state that is uh, that is suffering uh, scarcity of, of water. And basically what they were doing is setting up a bunch of henchmen or, or sicarios around small lakes, creeks, rivers, and then every farmer or every local in, in that area will have to pay a fee to use that water. At the uh-huh. same time, they were, they were extracting water from these bigger lakes and, and bigger uh, rivers and then selling that water to hotels and restaurants in, in, in most touristic areas in Chihuahua since, uh, since they, they, I mean, the, the water was, was being pretty much uh, limited. And uh, so they were doing a lot of money uh, just from monopolizing water, which, which was mind-blowing to me to, to learn that they were banking on such a, yeah, such, such a, such a, I don't know. Uh, you would think such a know, sort of like above above water, pardon the pun, kind of like uh, industry. Yeah, right. Yeah. I guess the the only other business left is uh, it's oxygen. You know, like it's <laughs> that's, that's that going to be next or what? I mean, they yeah. literally have their hands on on everything. But uh, but yeah, I mean, as long as as long as something is profitable, whenever they are at war, and in between the state of of Sonora and Baja California, in in Mexico. There is an infight between th- these two factions of the same Sinaloa cartel. The uh, factions, of, the faction of the sons of El Chapo, known as Los Chapitos, and another mm. faction owned by uh, El Mayo Zambada, one of the one of the oldest uh, members, founders of the Sinaloa cartel, called uh, Los Rusos. So they've been fighting for several years now for for those two states, for the control, for the full control of those two states. And I guess uh, they need a, They need more men. They need more weapon. They need more vehicles. And I think that's when they started targeting other industries, other than just drug trafficking or extorting. Um, and and thought that I mean, ten billion pesos over the span of three months wouldn't wouldn't be bad for them, right? Yeah. What what's that in um, U.S. dollars then, roughly? I think that should be ah oh, roughly. Let me let me let me try to do the math because I'm, I'm I suck at math. Yeah, sorry, but, um, just putting you on the spot. I can't even add up like dart <laughs> scores, so I can't do math at all. <laughs> all right, one sec. Uh, let me do the the compression here. It's uh, it's around six hundred thousand US dollars. Okay. okay, okay. So like yeah. So this is all part of like a wider arms race between these two factions. Um, mm-hmm. and, and, and so, I mean, actually, I was just noticing something interesting because this is like, it kind of mirrors the old colonial trade paths, right? Like from Acapulco to Manila and like through to China and all this stuff. But um, so, so like, how did you kind of go about reporting this stuff? Like, well, and, <laughs> don't tell me who your sources were, obviously, but, you know, how, how close were you able to get to this like one incident and um so, sort of what you know that how did you manage to sort of expand it into these wider trends and the war between the two factions yeah so this one was particularly difficult to report on since i didn't have the time to go on the ground so i was i was in between travels mm. and also i think this was one was um time sensitive since the season for fishing jellyfish was almost over um, so what I did is I managed to get a hold of a friend who lives down in a city called Guaymas in Tonora, and he helped me out to go and interview fishermen in, in the in the in the Pacific coast, 
Mm. And then I got the phone of the um, director of fishing and wildlife for the state. Uh, it's, a, it's an independent, independent organization. And he also helped me out a lot trying to figure out if this was actually happening, if this was a trend or if this was just a matter of one time, uh, you know, like incident. Mm. And he hooked me up also with other fishermen and other people around it. Uh, of course, a lot of them were very scared to talking openly about this, especially over the phone with someone they don't know. So, I mean, I did my best to, you know, to, to try to, to try to make them uh, trust me. Only a mm -hmm. couple of them trust me enough to get, to give me an interview, uh, respecting their, their, you know, their, their identity and stuff. Um, yeah. but I also thought that it was going to be a good idea to try to talk to someone inside the Sinaloa cartel over the years. I've been, I've been covering that organization deeply and have developed a, a lot of a lot of sources inside the Sinaloa cartel in different factions in different states even outside the country a lot of them are, well not a lot of them but some of them are in the US um, some of some others are in Colombia so I started talking to some of these guys to know why they knew about it and then they reached out to other 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 workers or their affiliates in that state and stuff and I managed to get a hold of one of them uh, working on, on these uh, specific, uh, yeah, operation, right? Like the legal operation. Mm, mm. And, um, and, and I mean, he was, he was very, he was very honest. He was literally telling me that we're, we're at war. We need money from whatever we can take. And the fishermen are making a lot of money. And basically he was saying like, we're not asking them to stop working. We're just asking them to sell it to us. And then we'll sell it to the salt company. So we're not stopping the industry. We just want to be in the middle so we can make money and keep, you know, like buying, yeah, weapons and, and paying uh, cigarios, basically. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and it's not just, I mean, obviously, it's not just jellyfish or even fish or in, any other, uh, like, legitimate industries. I mean, you've been writing about the, um, the narco wars going back for, for a long time now. Um, uh, you, you've recently been writing about kind of the, you know, meth and fentanyl, these drugs yeah. that are increasingly being produced in Mexico. How... I mean, it seems like there's a competing narrative, right? There's a government narrative in Mexico and the US that this stuff is yeah. all elsewhere. We're fighting it, but also it's China's fault or there's none of it at all. And then there's the reality on the ground, which is that the production of fentanyl and, and, and meth seems to be skyrocketing. Um, and you've yeah. been writing about that recently a lot. Can you tell us a bit more about, you know, how you've seen those drugs um in the news in your work in the last sort of six to 12 months? Absolutely, man. I mean, writing and reporting about, around fentanyl has been very, very challenging because fentanyl, I mean, first, first of all, fentanyl is absolutely more profitable than any other drug. Uh, that that cartels have their hands on. Mm. It's 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 probably over a hundred times more profitable than than heroin or than than cocaine. Cocaine has been dropping prices steadily, and and, and fentanyl has been you know like uh, get, getting more and more expensive. And um, I first reported, I actually uh, posted a video early on on my YouTube channel, probably like two years ago, or something where I went inside one of these kitchens and this was when the whole discussion about fentanyl was not even as big as it is as it is today. So the access was probably more easy, but but but, but the information out there was more scarce. So I was like, what what the hell is this fentanyl thing and, and what are these blue pills these guys are, are manufacturing? I could tell that this was a huge operation. Uh, broken down into small different houses or meals mm. um but but then right today the challenging side of reporting on fentanyl is that you have three different narratives you have the official narrative in mexico then you have the unofficial narrative in mexico told by cartel members and then you have the u.s narrative uh, of, of of this business of this illegal industry and sometimes the three of them are in line, but sometimes, so many times, the three neighbors are, are, are absolutely opposite. Like right now, Mexico is saying Mexico doesn't produce any fentanyl. 
and that is that is a lie, but that, 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 that's also true at some, at some point. Uh, for the most part, Mexican drug cartels are not producing their own fentanyl. They're importing a ready-made uh, fentanyl powder from mostly from China, but also from other places like mm-hmm. most recently India and India. also Germany. Yeah, yeah. But, but, so, but it's happening so, more, right? It, it, the cartels yeah. are kind of getting into making those precursors into fentanyl. Is that is that stuff that you've been kind of seeing firsthand? Yeah, yes, absolutely. I mean, before it was all almost 100% just importing. But then when they learned that there were restrictions and everything was probably more difficult and they started like changing routes and going through South America, through Guatemala... Um, and and changing, uh, um, yeah, changing the you know from China to India and then Germany and stuff. They decided to buy their own precursors, and then have Chinese chemists flown into Mexico to teach them how to how to produce fentanyl properly. Um, so that 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 started happening so when 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 mexican president says that mexico is not producing its own fentanyl well that's not completely true i mean it's it's probably 10 percent of all the fentanyl that it's uh, that it's found in, in mexico that it's made in mexico 90 percent it's still imported but uh but it doesn't mean that it's not happening also Another Sinaloa cartel member, which is kind of like, we well, not kind of, he's really high on top, like one of the one of the high ranking members of the Sinaloa cartel currently. He's in the U.S. and he was telling me very recently how a lot of it it's being imported into the U.S. and then crossed over back to Mexico by land, then mixed into pills or heroin, and then smuggled back into the u.s which is which is kind of crazy yeah i was like so you're importing from china right to the u.s and then from the u.s smuggle back into mexico and then manufacture the the drugs you want to do whatever and then smuggle them back to the u.s and he's like yeah sometimes it's it's easier because uh because no one's checking the border you know when you go north to south usually uh, the authorities are more you know uh yeah more looking over Coming mm. north, I mean, um, yeah, going north, not going southbound. Wow. So, so yeah, yeah, yeah. This is this is an ever changing game, you know. It's like when, whenever whenever I write a story, things change, and then probably my story gets old, you know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's 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 pretty nuts. I mean, you've been writing also about how kind of um, you know smuggling human trafficking routes as well as sort of um, being sort of commandeered by by cartels right and and sort of the the current the measures that the u.s is trying to put in place even down to like a, an app that the administration recently developed uh to try and sort of ease the issues around smuggling um yeah this is this is all kind of taken over by the cartels i mean the cartels are pretty much all conquering um in in the routes between those two borders right yeah, 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 absolutely. I mean, those those borders are absolutely. I mean, they're 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 not not close. They're not really watched over. There, there is. I mean, it is really impossible to to really close the gaps between that border because the biggest gap is the gap made to be meant to be open, right? Like the the international ports of entry. That's where mm-hmm. most of the drugs, like ninety five, ninety nine percent of the drugs get across to ports of entry um, for the simple reason that drug cartels are, are, I mean, are smart organizations, right? They say like, well, let's, let's push stuff in through the flow that it's already open and let's not try to open another, another gap in between, right? Because it's probably going to be harder and, and more easy to, to find the drugs that are going through to, you know, irregular port, uh, ports of entry. Yeah. Um, what they do is they put a lot of money to corrupt border officials. That it's, it, that's that, that's something that, that we don't hear really often. Um, you know, CBP or Border Patrol agents working with or for drug cartels, but that is definitely happening on a larger scale. We usually see investigation that seems to be 
unrelated or, you know, single individuals and not something that it's actually organized. But mm -hmm. um, but this is something very well organized and, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a machine that it's really well oiled and, and it's something that is systematic uh, in, 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 in CBP and Border Patrol agents. Even though they do good money, uh, even for, for a U.S. Uh, resident or, or citizen, um, they still get enticed by these guys because what they're paying is big tons of money. I mean, they're not paying, yeah, yeah. you know, 60K, whatever. They're, they're paying above the hundreds to, to an agent like that for each, each crossing. Um, some others play more dirty, like organizations like La Linea, which is the armed wing of the Juarez cartel. And what they usually do is they send out, you know, hot young woman to meet one of these guys at a bar, hang around with them, whatever. They take him to bath. And, uh, and then they, these, these girls grab pictures of, of them together. And then turns out that these girls are underage. So, so they basically uh -huh. extort him by saying, you know what, you, you're, just, you're just being with an underage and I can end your career, get you to jail and probably tell your wife and your family what you've been up to. Or I can give you money every time you let us cross, uh, you know, a, a load mm -hmm. uh, when, you're, when you're on, 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 yeah, on, on shift, um, which is definitely more, you know, more rowdy than, than just paying, bribing a, a, an individual, right? Yeah, it's kind of a new twist on Plum or Plata, right? It's kind of yeah, slightly, yes, exactly, it's more yeah. like spycraft than, than that. Um, <laughs> so, like, I mean, we've seen it go going on in Europe as well. Like, the rip on rip off cocaine trade is just like gigantic. And it's not going through, it's not going through like the mules that the politicians like to talk about. It's, it's going straight through the docks and on the backs of like gigantic cargo ships. Like, it's coming yeah, in, yeah, yeah. in gigantic <laughs> quantities. Um, so you, you mentioned this kind of like the war between Zambada's guys and Los Chapitos. Um, like how, how is that playing out at the moment? Like wh where do you see that going? What's the current state of play? So these, these, this fight between them, it, it was, was pretty much low key, right? It started a while back. It started as, as a local beef over the city of Culiacán, which is the cradle mm -hmm. of the Sinaloa cartel. And um, for the most part, when El Chapo was out, everything was at ease because he kept a balance between he, El Mayo, and there are a lot of other families that are not well known, but they're, they're actually big, big, big players, you know, in, in the Sinaloa cartel. Um, Probably some of the lesser known, but that are out there are, are Los, Los Alazar, um, and well, a couple of others. And, and there, there's also mm -hmm. a, a lot of a lot of others that I personally know, and they are they haven't been in the news never. So no one really has you know like learned about these families. But so they kept these these balance between those families and the biggest factions, the the, the Mayo and, and, and El Chapo. When El Chapo got extradited. He was. He allegedly left the whole organization to his right hand, Damaso Lopez, el licenciado. Mm. Then los chapitos started beefing over him, saying that the Sinaloa cartel belonged to them, even though El Chapo didn't want them to get involved in the cartel. And um, then El Mayo stepped in. He was basically, hey, let's respect my compadre's will, right? Uh, he he said that the cartel was going to go to to El Licenciado and not to you guys. And then they started beefing against El Mayo. So what they did is they started charging a 30% to every other family, including um, uh, the Zambadas, of all operations in Culiacán. So now they everybody had to pay 30% of, what, of whatever business they did, legal or illegal, in Culiacán. Um, and I think El Mayo, it's, a, it's an old man, so I think it's, uh, he's, he's also a smart man. So instead of going to war, because that was just going to be detrimental for everyone, he decided to comply, but then he took over most of the borders. Tijuana, San Luis Rio Colorado, Mexicali, 
So whenever Los Chapitos needed to stash or get their drugs across, he will charge that same 30%. Um, uh, but now yeah. on the border. So he was getting everything back, um, which, was a, which was, a, was a smart move. So they, they first both sent armed groups to all of these borders. Los Rusos, uh, Los Flechas, so d- different, different armed groups owned by El Mayo Zambada and the other ones by Los Chapitos. Uh, and I think that beef started there at the border, at the U.S.-Mexico border between these two, these two mm-hmm. factions. But now it's, uh, now it's back again in Culiacán. Los Chapitos have been feeling the pressure by the U.S. for producing fentanyl, and they've been trying to frame El Mayo uh, hardly. They've been sending out uh, pr- like pressers, you know, comunicados and photos mm-hmm. and leaking a lot of uh, quote-unquote exclusive information where they found that it was actually El Mayo producing these massive uh, fentanyl laboratories, which he's, he's also doing. But, um, but, but many, many of the times that we see, or we, we as, as, as uh, members of the press, receive information from anonymous sources, it's, uh, it's, it's Los Chapitos trying to frame El Mayo over, over a lab or, or, or stuff like that. It's just um, like they're, they're, br- they're briefing the press against each other like, like politicians yeah. would do then. Like it's like yes. <laughs> kind of embedded is crazy. It's um, crazy, man. And, and, and it put us, puts us in a very vulnerable position because me, myself, I, I speak both languages and I cover a lot the Sinaloa cartel. And I have a lot of sources inside. And so both factions have been, have been feeding me with a lot of fucking propaganda against each other. So my, my emails, secure or unsecure emails, my inboxes uh, from every other social, you know, are flooded with propaganda against each other. So I guess they really want to start that beef over my, over my, over my reporting, you know, which is, which is, yeah, it's a, it's a thin line to walk on, you know? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Stay safe, man. Um, okay. So a, a couple more things. I mean, uh, first of all, uh, you obviously report on CJNG as well. Um, is, is Mencho dead? <laughs> That's one of the questions that everyone's <laughs> always asking us. So I'm like, we don't know. Yeah. So do you know? Uh, I mean, it's it's hard it's hard to tell. Every now and then, we get we get a lot of, you know, leaking saying that yeah, Mencho is actually dead, and um, but it's it's really hard to tell. Now, when when I when they ask me this question, because a lot, I usually answer with another question, which is like, what, does it matter? You know, the, the, is is this going to change <laughs> yeah. the way the CJNG has been operating in the last couple of years? Uh, what we know is Elmenchu is pretty ill. He, uh, I think he has, uh, I can't remember, but it's, uh, it's something really bad. Like so liver he, failure he, or he, something like this? Uh, yeah, exactly. It's like kidney yeah. failure or something like that. Where he, where he yeah. needs, yeah. Yeah, he needs like a like hospital and stuff. Um, so... Even though, I mean, if we if we imagine that he's actually he's actually been dead for the last two couple of years, I don't think that really changes anything about how the the Carter Jalisco has been operating in Mexico. They they they've been amassing more and more power, more and more money. They've been earning more and more territories and breaking a lot of alliances in every other territory that it's not completely controlled by them. They do have alliances with, uh, yeah, with, uh, with a smaller criminal organization operating at each region. Like in Chihuahua, they do not have a strong presence where we've seen, you know, these convoys of pickup trucks or whatever. But they, uh, two years ago, they broke an alliance with La Linea, with an with a armed branch of the, of the Juarez cartel to fight against the Sinaloa cartel on, on these states. So, so yeah, I mean, even, even if he was that, I don't think this is changing anything for this cartel. For the most part, I've been, I've been exploring the possibility that most of these comunicados that have been popping up on social l- lately with 
the alleged voice of El Mencho are AI generated. It's so easy to, to generate right now, you know, whatever voice, say whatever you want. That um, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't be surprised that most of these uh, of these pressers where they where we see these uh, group of armed men face mask we don't even see their mouth mouth moving or anything. Um, it's AI generated stuff, you know. God, auto tune in the narco world is a terrible thing. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> yes. So. Uh, I mean, what what are you kind of currently working on? You got anything else? You got any travel coming up? Anything else planned? Yeah, I mean, as a matter of fact, I'm I'm leaving I'm leaving a couple of hours to Michoacan to report on the self defense groups. Oh, Michoacan wow. right now it's probably one of the most violent states in in in, in the whole country. Uh, we have over six different cartels or criminal organizations operating along with the so-called self-defenses, which some of them are not self-defense, are actually cartels, cartels fighting other yeah. cartels. So it's dude, it's a uh, it's crazy, man. Have you seen this meme of of Spider Man of like three, four Spider Mans pointing at each other? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I yeah. think that's literally what's happening in, in Michoacan. You have self-defense groups, you have cartels, you have military, you have federal police, local state police, Jesus. and everybody's pointing at each other saying like, he's cartel, you know? So, so it's, uh, you, you it's reported, a... You reported mess. like a guy being killed quite recently, right? There was, there was quite a prominent member of the Alta Defensas that was, that was murdered, like shot to death in his car. Exactly. Hippolito Mora, he was, he was the OG of the self-defense groups. He was the first one who found that the first uh, Auto Defensa in, in Mexico in uh, 10 years ago, in 2013. Um, I, be, I, I was in touch with him before he was murdered because I really wanted to go and interview him because I knew he was going to get killed. He, he had three mm -hmm. uh, assassination attempts uh, this year alone. So I was like, dude, they're going to get to him. I need to go and, and get there and talk to Hippolito. And um, unfortunately, they got to him before I could, could interview him. So now I'm traveling to, to where he was uh, killed and his body was burned uh, inside his pickup truck to talk to his family, talk to other auto defensas and try to understand if the, if the self-defense groups are, are still existing as they said they were because one of these self-defense groups was called Los Viagras and now they're one of the main cartels. Mm. In in Michoacan, uh, who uh, Hippolito accused of of being cartel and being behind his uh, his assassinations uh, assassination attempts. So so yeah, man, it's 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 pretty fucking messy. I'm I'm leaving literally in a couple of hours and uh, and and getting back on on Monday, hopefully with with some interesting reporting from on the ground down there. Shit. Well, um, I will leave you to make sure you pack enough uh, stuff to keep safe, and um, <laughs> I, I'll, I'll put a link to your work on uh, on the show as well. Um, and and you wrote, uh, you put out a photo book last year, right? Do you want to tell us a quick thing about that before we uh, before we before we end it? Yeah, absolutely, man. And um, yeah, I, I put out these uh, these photo book called uh, something like uh, reporting from the narco world. 2022 that was just an exercise of you know a lot of photos taken by me with a with a proper camera but some others with my cell phone and some others with other cell phones you know like it's literally imagery that i've been gathering around my reportings and hopefully i get I, i'm gonna get another one um on, on 2023 on all the reporting including breaking inside the uh, El Chapo's son house in, in Sinaloa, the house of Abido Guzman and mm. some other some other crazy places I've been uh, this year. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Well, um, I can hear my baby son screaming in the next room. So while you go and report in Michoacan and I'm going to go and wipe a child's ass. Uh, so we've got basically the same thing. Um, yeah, exactly, but, uh, man. Literally. Yeah. But stay Luis, safe. thanks, thanks ever so there, much. Man. Yeah, cheers. Thanks ever so much for joining us today, Luis. And um, yeah, right, I, I'd love to catch up with you after your trip as well. It sounds sounds pretty crazy. Absolutely, man. Thanks for thanks for having me. And, uh, and let's talk soon. Cheers.